Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from across Canada. Now, our mission on the show is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is from Big Lakes County, Deputy Reeve, Lane Monteith. Big Lakes County is dedicated to strengthening an environment of opportunity, affordability, and a great community to call home. They are committed to creating a space where individuals and families can thrive, businesses can grow, and the community can flourish. Now, according to the Big Lakes County values, they envision a future where Big Lakes County is recognized as a region of boundless opportunities, affordable living, and a welcoming community that people are proud to call home. Attention Saskatchewan. This election season, Municipal Affairs is hitting the road in partnership with SUMA for the Saskatchewan Provincial Election. Join us on election night for live coverage straight from Regina on YouTube featuring exclusive insights from municipal leaders and stakeholders across the province. We will be capturing their reaction to the results and be diving into what the new provincial government means for municipalities. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan to hear directly from local leaders about the issues that matter most to you. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan starting September 30th to hear directly from local leaders like yourself about the issues that matter most. This is your election covered like never before. Municipal Affairs, your trusted voice from the grassroots to the government. <laughs> Deputy Reeve, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit and start by asking you, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Lane? Quite honestly, I'm not sure. My grandfather was involved years ago with the REA and 4-H and all that. So for me, it was, I'd been involved with the Ultra Rodeo here for a few years. My daughter ran for Queen and I stayed out of it until she was done with it. Uh, so I just kind of, it was kind of a next step for me. It's not something I ever thought I would be doing, but it was uh, it was time for for maybe a change. And no, but I don't like seeing people get in just by acclamation. That's uh, I hope uh, when we do have our next election that there's somebody else running as well, and it can be a good run. It's it's that it, in order to be a democracy, we need those people out there. It's been a learning curve. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a few seconds. But you grew up and born and raised in Big Lakes County, or yeah, did you move? Okay, lived so for my entire life, um, I, I got to break... ask the stupid question. Then, yeah. did you pay attention to what was going on at council before you decided to put your name in because you didn't want an acclamation? Uh, prior to a little bit, but it was more watching the the news on the TV and we'll listen to the political side of it. Not really at the local level. You you knew your taxes were gonna were due, and this county's been very good to me. Uh, for the most part, we've had really good people in administration and for councillors. Uh, nobody wants to raise the taxes, and knowing most of them on on council the whole whole time I've grown up, it was uh, it's just the way it was going to be. But it is it's different once you get on in there for sure. So what was the big difference for you looking back on your time in office so far? What was the most eye-opening sort of moment for you that you went, oh, I didn't expect this is something that we would be dealing with? Uh, I knew the budgeting was going to be was going to be tough to deal with because I've never really dealt with that. So, yeah, learning, learning how the budget, I knew a little bit about it. And it was different from personal life to basically to the government side of it. I knew there was going to be differences there. Uh, and you get thrown into the deep end in some sense because you get elected and you're literally in budget seats. Oh, for sure. For sure. That was the first thing. And at the time, uh, I think our CAO, I think it was the CAO that said, realistically, this isn't even, isn't even our budget. He said, this is more of an administration budget. And as we go along, you guys can change it because it is a living document and ask questions about it. And yeah, they were very good to us that way. But yeah, the first one was, it was interesting. There was all kinds of questions coming up on why and how and 
and this and yeah rightfully so people just didn't understand the government side of budgeting as opposed to personal or or private industry looking back on your time i can imagine you've come to the realization that your the decisions you make around that council table are tough are tough for people and tough for yourself because you are impacting people's day-to-day lives a little bit how important is it for yourself to be prepared when you walk into that council meeting to know what you're voting on, but also be prepared to make a tough decision that not everyone's going to like. You have to realize you're not going to please all the people all the time. Uh, some of the decisions we're making now may not, how can I word, may not really do much effect for another two or three years. We don't know, right? It's going to take some time for a lot of the decisions to play out. Uh, Nobody can see the future for sure. But at the same time, there's stuff that we do control that we can maybe make an impact on fairly fairly fast that way, fairly quickly. But yeah, it's it's been a it's been a road. <laughs> do the decision do the decisions come easier as time goes on, or are you still finding yourself making those tough choices even four or six years later? I'm there's still tough choices. There's no no getting around it. Uh, especially when it has so, to do. How, how do you with... make those easier though? How do you as a deputy reeve or even as a counselor for your area, make those tough decisions easier for yourself? So that way, you know, you're making the right choice, but at the end of the day, it's still a tough decision. What yeah. what process do you put into place to ensure that you're making the right decision? I look at my ward, of course, first. And if it's going to benefit my ward that, yeah, it kind of makes it a little easier, but you have to look, overall at the county what's going to be best for the county because we're all in this together uh so yeah one thing for the for the ward may not be the best thing for the county or it may be the best thing for the county and go against what what would be good for your ward so yeah it's it's there can be times when it's a little bit stressful but read the package do the research and uh hope for the best in the end i guess <laughs> is it how do I ask this question without asking the stupid question? But it seems like I'm asking all the stupid questions already. So why not ask one more stupid question today? Um, I can imagine that sometimes, you know, you're going to get it wrong because the information you have at the day that you go into that council meeting could change by the time you make that decision or three days later, is it important to always reevaluate for yourself what decisions you're making and put them in the context of we're doing this in the best interest of the, the information were provided. And if it changes tomorrow, then we could potentially reevaluate that situation and come back to a decision later on. Oh, for sure. If, if we feel we made a decision or I feel I made a, a, the wrong decision, I have a chance to discuss it with the counselors besides. And yeah, we can always put forward a motion to bring it back within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for administration to have all the answers all the time. So yeah, we, we do we do send some of the stuff back to them and, and say, let's get a little more information on this before we go and make a, a full on decision and say, yes, this is what we're doing. But at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're a group of nine and we all live by the sword and die by the sword. We, we have to, it has to be a, a united front anyway. We may not all agree all the time, but we all, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're trying to be consistent with our decisions too. Looking locally, you, you said you when you make those decisions, you put them in the perspective of the best interest of the district that you represent and then as the county as a whole. Yeah. But when you're sworn in, you're not sworn in as District 4, District 2 uh, councillor. You're sworn in as a Big Lakes County councillor. Is, right. it, is it hard to balance what your community needs with the general consensus of your county? Because you're elected by the people, but you're there to represent all, even those who don't live in your ward or district. Oh, for sure, Chris. Uh, we, uh, in my ward, I've got a hamlet, of course, but there's, I think, three other wards that don't have hamlets or four other wards. So at the end of the day, what may be good for the hamlet may not be so good for the, for the other four. So how's that going to work out? It all depends on what it is, what the, what the uh, what the question is at the, on that on the table of today. I mean, if it's something that's going to cost everybody money and only going to going to uh, 
help one hamlet, shall we say, or maybe two, then you really got to think about it. Is is this what we want to spend our money on, or is, is there something better as the county goes that we could be using it towards? So yeah, okay. a lot of it plays into the dollars and cents of things as well. We're going to talk about dollars and cents in a few minutes, but I want to stick on the people of your ward for a second. Um, now, I, I, I guess I should have said this up front, but uh, this is the second time Lane and I have chatted about this for this show. <laughs> Due to a technical issue on our end, we had to re-record the interview, and we appreciate you doing this. And um, I want to talk about an area that we didn't get to because I remember watching it and going, why isn't this recording properly? But I want to talk about the engagement the apathy mm -hmm. because you talk about how you were wanting to get involved because you didn't want to see people acclaimed and i think that's right and i think people acclamations are probably the worst things for democracy that's my opinion and that's my opinion yeah. alone in your ward do you or district i should say is it district or it's, ward? It's we're wards okay we're you're wards. yeah every county and empty is different right I don't, <laughs> can't just all be the same um <laughs> Do you get a sense that there's a apathy as long as my taxes are low and the garbage is picked up or the waste transfer station is open? I'm comfortable with what's going on at county city hall or for the county uh, council. Or do you get a sense that people are actually engaged and want to talk to you about the issues that are in front of county council? Right now in my ward, I don't get a whole bunch of guys complaining and whatnot, but there again, I'm a little more proactive too. If uh, if somebody's got a, a problem, they, they can call me anytime. Uh, but if there's something going on, the road is is oh it needs to be greater, whatever. I don't hesitate to call the office before somebody calls me and try and get them tell them look the road is getting in a little rough shape. Send somebody out to check it out and and go there. Uh, but yeah, there's for the most part, as long as the taxes are reasonable, I'm not even going to say low because right now we do have one of the lower tax rates in in the province but as long as they're reasonable and the services are being done to what people expect we don't hear a whole great deal of complaints uh so yeah it's i try and be proactive when it comes to problems but and head them off before they get too big is it hard to be a proactive in such a large county though because while you your area is the Nilda area, it, mm -hmm. it is a large geographic area. And when people and I say large in the sense that like you think a city ward in downtown Edmonton or Calgary is large. Yeah. No, you go to Big Lakes County. They are large areas. Is yeah. it hard to be proactive and try to get to all the issues that people have and not be as reactive because it, you, you're only one person and you oh, don't yeah. have a team working for you. And I can imagine you have an abundance of people who have challenges for themselves or want a little bit more proactive approach when it comes yeah. to the issues that they're I, facing. We get the odd call or I get the odd call anyway. The street light is out in an old, uh, uh, this call for just plug, that kind of thing. That's great. I don't always get into an old because of the hamlet. I get my mail there, but I'm not always the one that goes. And when it comes to the street lights, I don't go there at night. <laughs> But yeah, if somebody calls me, then I can get it forwarded on to to uh, Public Works, and then they'll get in touch with ATCO or whomever looks after getting that done. Uh, yeah, it's it's just a matter of, of making sure that the communication lines are open. That seems to be the big thing. As long as people uh, are communicating, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. When they are communicating with you, you said that they are yeah. more proactive. Um, are they they communicating about municipal issues only, or do you get a sense that people are engaging with you because you are the closest to them? They probably see you more often than they see their MLA or their MP, so they're probably more uh, more inclined to probably approach you about provincial issues, about healthcare, about education, about highway that goes through Big Lakes County. It's a major provincial highway that goes through the not a yeah. major, but it's a provincial highway. So yeah. do you get a sense that people understand? where they should be addressing their concerns or are you just willing to take all the questions and be proactive for provincial and federal issues as well? Well, they know we meet with ministers, I wouldn't say on a regular basis, but as often as we can, as long as you can get a face-to-face -face with them. Uh, but if they're not, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I had to I laugh at that. <laughs> You're the if, first one uh, and not the only one to say that on the show. Yeah. 
but yeah, if they've got a concern and we know it's a, a provincial issue, we'll tell them, look, we can try, but you have to realize this is a provincial issue. We, we're going to have to go through the right channels. And in some cases, it's actually quicker for them to get a hold of the, the local provincial office, be it here in High Prairie, in High Prairie or in some cases in Peace River, wherever, and uh, go from there. But we will take it, take their concerns and give them to the MLA or the minister that could potentially be involved if there's time, if time allows. And uh, if we can get an audience with them, like when we go out to RMA here in a few weeks, uh, we've got a few few concerns on there that it doesn't just affect one or two citizens in in the wards. It can affect a whole group of them, right? It can. Um, I actually, I just recorded an interview this morning with someone from RMA. So it's yeah. serendipitous that we're talking about RMA at the exact <laughs> same time. Um, you, you are the closest to the people, as we just said, as I just said, but... When you leave your house and you go to the grocery store or to the general store, you are a municipal counselor at all times, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This question is more about advice. Now, you've done this for a term in the – correct me if I'm wrong, two terms, right? This is your second no, term. No, this is my third year. This third, third, third year. Third, third year. Yeah. Third, third year. I apologize. Now, you've done this for three years. The life of a local politician is quite 24-7. It is 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You are mm -hmm. always on. Have you found that balance? And what advice would you give a potential other candidate who is trying to look for that balance to be able to say, I want to be a local councillor, but I'm not sure if I can dedicate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because there might be an emergency that comes up. There might be budget season that comes up and weekends are going to be taken away. What advice would you give to that next generation of municipal leaders who are thinking about putting their name on the ballot next year? Talk to your spouse ahead of time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Make sure, make sure there's good communication between you and your significant other to start with, because they have to realize you are there 24 uh, seven. I've been very fortunate. I don't get a whole bunch of calls on the weekends and that, but, uh, and if I don't answer my phone, it goes to my voicemail. So, I'm there, but, you, but I'm, you, I may, may not, not answer right away. Not, you may not get the phone calls, but you're in budget talks starting yep. this month. And that means that you were going to be basically at that council table, not just for a regular four hour meeting or five hour meeting, depending on how long they are. Yeah. You could be there for two days, oh, yeah. eight hours a day. And that's a pretty uh, big chunk of time commitment that you're giving up to yeah. family time and balancing that. Yeah. But for us, it's during the day. So most of the, most of the other counselors and myself, our wives or our spouses are at work as well. Uh, a lot of us that are on council are farmers and retirees. So we make sure we make the time and that we've got our stuff done before that so we can focus on what's ahead. Uh, we just had a preliminary budget meeting that lasted, I think it was four hours or five hours. And then we've got uh, a two day session coming up here I believe it's sometime in November. It would be a, a Friday and a, and a Monday kind of thing. But with it being broke up, that gives us a chance to come up with questions so we can question administration on the first part of the budget, whether it's operational capital, whatever they bring forward. And then we'll have an opportunity after the second day to just kind of digest everything and then get back to them with some more questions. And then we'll have another big meeting after that, which will probably last six, seven hours. I want to turn to the big, big Lakes County as a whole now. And before I do this, I want to preface this line of questioning with this statement. Um, this is a conversation between the deputy Reeve and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. That being said, some of the questions, some of the answers may be lined up with what's going on at council, but at the end of the day, it's still his opinion. He is one member of nine on a council that needs a majority to get anything passed. So nothing's going to get passed today in this episode oh, no. of this recording. <laughs> That being said, I'm far from having quorum. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Deputy Reeve, in your opinion, what do you believe are the biggest challenges? I'm going to open and end it here. Uh, what do you believe are the biggest challenges facing Big Lakes County today? Right now, one of the biggest ones is uh, oil companies not paying their taxes. 
Okay. As simple as that. Uh, we're looking at oil companies that owe us roughly, say, $9 million before penalties. Some of those are going back a few years. But at the end of the day, we can't we can't dwell on that. That's that's one of the biggest challenges of getting those guys paid in that or caught up from them. Is so before you ever- move on here, I want to just play in this wheeled wheeled house for a second because yeah. RMA, the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, just recently released a survey saying these zombie oil and gas companies, not all oil and gas companies, oh, but no. some of these oil and gas companies owe an approximately $300 million to rural municipalities. Yep. Now you're telling me that chunk is $9 million for your community of Big Lakes yep. County. That's a lot of infrastructure dollars that you could be using towards other areas that you need. Bridges, repairs, road upgrades, yep. so on and so forth. What is Big Lakes County doing today to address that shortfall and i say shortfall in the sense that that's nine million dollars you have to find somewhere else yeah well we've started and i believe we started last year the year before i can't remember for sure chris uh putting aside a little bit more uh into our reserves to help cover that off is it going to cover it off all of it off no absolutely not but if we can prepare for stuff that's down on the road once things get ironed out with these oil companies that we have this problem with, we can be better prepared for, hopefully not, we won't have to worry about it again, but others that may follow suit. Uh, It is really tough when, what I'd like to see is the government, they always get their royalty checks, take a little bit more for that royalty and give it back to the counties for as far as taxes and that. Uh, Because yeah, the oil companies, and they don't stop pumping. The pumps are still moving. Government's still getting its royalty money. So maybe we need to look at something along those lines where we have to tie the the taxes they owe to the royalties that the province is collecting. Will it work? I don't know. It's just opinion. just an opinion. <laughs> no, it, exactly. It's just an opinion, like I said at the beginning. Yeah. Has Big Lakes County met with either Minister Brian Jean, Minister of Environment, Minister Rick McIver of Municipal Affairs? Because AER, which is the Alberta Energy yep. Regulator, is the one that basically mandates the oil and gas sector. I know. Yeah. Has Big Lakes County met with anyone from AER, from the Energy uh, Portfolio or Municipal Affairs to say, this is a concern of ours, and this is going to fall on the backs of our taxpayers if the province yeah. doesn't fix this tomorrow. We have brought it to Minister McIver's attention, um, and we had a, last year at RMA, we actually met with AER, albeit in, at the trade booth, but we still had a chance to talk to him ex- and express our displeasure, shall we say, with how things are being done. And hopefully we'll get a minister, uh, minister's meeting again this year, Perhaps the Brian Jean, that'd be great. But we'll talk to anybody and it may see if we can get a trickle down effect. You never know. Do you get a sense that, uh, and I shouldn't say, do you get a sense? I'm going to rephrase this question. Do your residents understand that when you do raise taxes, even though that they are the one of the lowest in the country, the province, mm-hmm. when you raise taxes, it's not because you want to, it's because companies like this are not paying their taxes. So don't be angry at us, the politicians. Be angry at the people who aren't paying their taxes because no. I know, you know, if you don't pay your property taxes, well, your house is going up for sale because yeah. there's going to be a tax. There's sale. repercussions. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they all fully understand it. There's those out there that, of course, they do follow it. and They, they follow the markets and whatnot as well. And they can see who's in trouble and who isn't. But for the most part, I don't think everybody totally understands how, and I don't don't like using the term dependent on oil, we are. But for our county, yeah, we, we depend on, on uh, industry as a whole to help support our tax dollars and our rate payers. So we'll look because- at anything to keep things going that way. Because most your your major industries, and I apologize if this is uh, wrong as of today, but your major industries right now is agriculture and the energy sector, right? Agriculture, forestry, and energy. Yeah, forestry. That's right. Yeah. I always forget forestry. Yeah, we've got the the two mills yeah. here in town, West so. Fraser, right? West, yeah, yeah, and Tolco. Tolco, that's the other one. They just yeah. reopened a few years ago. Yes, they did. Yeah, they just got rolling here maybe a month or so ago. Oh, good for them. Um, yeah. Okay, so. 
oil and gas dereliction of yeah. unpaid property taxes is a major concern. Is there yeah. any other concern that you want to just talk about as well? Because I want to make sure we, we pull it the ground yeah. because that's just not just Big Lakes County, but is there a local issue that you can talk about? Yeah, the healthcare. Uh, we just had a new hospital built here, 217 million, beautiful hospital, two ORs. Uh, we have no maternity. Uh, the, other, the other big thing that sticks on our craw is we have no uh, helipad. And we had a lot of STARS traffic through here. Now, we've been struggling meeting with the AHS, uh, the health ministers and infrastructure and all that. And we just keep getting bounced around. And I guess the part that really sticks on our craw is you get areas, and I don't, I don't hold it against them by any stretch. I'm I'm happy for them, but you get the the people that are closer to the larger centers, like the high rivers, um, and for that matter, even smaller centers, Barhead and Marathorp. I believe they both have have helipads and airports. And the last letter we got back from from the health uh, minister's office after we had been in there in the spring was, you know, we understand you got you'd really like this, but you've got an airport that's seven kilometers away. And we looked at each other and said, yes, we do have an airport that's seven kilometers away, but it's on the other side of the railroad tracks too. And yeah. just last, not this past summer or summer before, we had a train derailment that was took a week to get. So now rather than driving seven kilometers, we're going 15 to 20 to get to the airport. So we can get somebody on that air, air transport. So yeah, this is that one sticks with us a little bit. So we we keep that in mind when we go and meet with the ministers and whatnot, and hopefully one day we can get it get it looked after. Because I I believe we have majority of the funding already set aside for the helipad. The the wiring and everything is in there. At one time, uh, one of the local residents contractors had uh, said he'd go in there and build it for nothing. So. Okay, that, that, so that's so I, I need to ask the life and death situation question mm -hmm. here because that's a lot to unload there. Because first off, you don't have a maternity ward in that beautiful hospital. And I remember going to that hospital when I got yeah. bitten by a dog in Big Lakes County out in uh, Faust once. So <laughs> I, I know yeah. that hospital quite well. I'm shocked that that doesn't happen. But I want to specifically ask about the helipad. Are you saying that when you have an emergency or when there's an emergency, someone has to, an ambulance has to come out and grip, get them and either drive them to Edmonton or drive them to, I, I wouldn't even say Slave Lake is probably even better because they probably don't have the same, they probably don't have as much resources as that new hospital, Peace River or even Grand Prairie. Like, are your if, residents going that far to get proper medical if, attention? If STARS has to fly in, they will fly them back to Grand Prairie, bro. If, yeah, if, uh, if uh, we have somebody that needs to be airlifted, my grandson had to be airlifted to the, to the stallery here um, this winter, I guess, about January, and air, airplane came into the airport. But you never know what's going to happen on, on that railroad track, right? Uh, other than that, yeah, he's in him or whoever is in an, uh, an ambulance on the way to either Grand Prairie or Edmonton. So besides advocating, which I can imagine every other municipality is also doing, what can Big Lakes County do in the short term to rectify this situation? Because healthcare, you and I know, is not a, a municipal jurisdiction. Yeah. You can't just open up a helipad and hope to God nope. someone uses it. So no, what exactly. does what do you do in the short term? And I say you as the royal, you as the Big Lakes County, mm -hmm. do in the short term to address this to make sure that people are safe. Well, we've just been using the airport as much as we can. I mean, we get 300, 300 plus airlifts out of there every year. Some you days get we one get four. A, almost one a day out of that yes. airport? Yes. I sit on the uh, airport committees. And, so, yeah, there's 300 plus airlifts out that are flying people back to Edmond, Edmonton every year. And they won't install a helipad. They won't put in a helipad so that our outlying communities, uh, the settlements and, and the, uh, and the reserves. And I talked to a counselor from, uh, from Gift Lake settlement. He said, yeah, we have, have them come in here all the time. And it's, so they fly in from Grand Prairie, the stars does, and then they fly them wherever they need to go. 
This is my usually buffet. it's back to usually it's back to Grand Prairie because it's closer, of course, right. and they've only got limited uh, limited fuel. So, and we have the fueling free fueling station there at the airport. So, and they have used that, which is great. It gives them a little more range that way, so they can get a little further north or wherever they need to go. <laughs> and I hate to beat a dead horse here, but I think I have to. <laughs> Can you give me a reason why they're telling you they can't put the helipad in? Is it because that Valley View already has one, so they don't know one up in High Prairie? Or no, is they, there any they feel explanation? That, that airport is close enough, and that from, from what the letter we got, the airport is close enough, and we don't need the helipad right at the at the at the hospital. So yeah, we we've, we've been we're going to keep working on it. That's all. That's the best we can do, unfortunately. And hopefully, at some point, we'll get get to talk with somebody, and they'll say, "Yeah, this is crazy." I've only heard of, I've only been talking about this for like five minutes and I already think it's crazy and I'm an outside observer here. <laughs> so anyway, that's here nor there. Yeah. But uh, no, it's not here or there. It's a big issue. And I think it the is. province needs to address yeah. it. Um, you, uh, again, Royal U, Big Lakes County has two very big macro issues that you've just talked about. Mm-hmm. Oil and gas, healthcare. And I say encompass the umbrellas of healthcare. How do you move forward on issues that are only in the municipal realm when you do have to deal with so many provincial issues? Because oil and gas is a provincial issue. Healthcare is a provincial issue, but you're using resources to ad- try to address issues that are outside your jurisdiction. Is it challenging to balance that, especially when people are struggling right now? Oh, well, somewhat. Yeah. We always have people asking, why haven't we got this in the hospital or when why do you guys keep raising taxes? And that's when it comes up. Look, if the oil companies would cover off their share of the taxes, we wouldn't have to raise them near as much or at all. Uh, as far as the hospital, it's, yeah, it's it's a government ball. And we just have to keep lobbying and pushing forwards with it. And hopefully, like I say, get a hold of somebody that will actually listen to our concerns and take them, call it a little bit more serious if you want. It's uh, it's something that we really need. Right now, as far as maternity work, and hopefully that gets changed soon, everybody's going Peace River Grand Prairie. So they're driving anywhere from an hour to two hours to, to have a baby. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I've i never had a child. I've never pushed out a child from my body. <laughs> but I can imagine that an hour or two hours is... For some women who are potentially having a child right away, is pretty painful while you're going through a major I, highway that is pretty uh, bumpy. If, you, if I say that, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> fortunate. I've never had to push one out either, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's not it's not good. I mean, uh, to say that uh, we can't have them because we haven't got proper staffing, that well, then let's look at getting proper staffing, and if that's what it takes. Amen to that, brother. But there again, it calls it comes back to the provincials, right? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does. But I, I I know that the Big Lakes County and even High Prairie do, does do doctor recruitment for themselves yeah. as well, correct? Yeah, for for yeah. the for quite a bit of yeah. But we still have to go through AHS and the Alberta Physicians Association or whatever it is there. So because in the end, they're the ones that are actually saying yes. We got doctors that are willing to go there too. But yeah, we try and recruit as many as we can, and we'll have now, to wait and see. <laughs> we certainly will. I don't want to see sound like Big Lakes County only has issues at all, because oh, no. you guys, oh, no. you guys <laughs> do have some good things going for you. And I'm gonna open and sort of flip the original question in the segment on its head and ask. What's the thing that Big Lakes County has going right for itself right now? Uh, when you look at all the challenges and you look at what's going wrong, you say, you know what? We have these challenges, but we've got this going for us. What is that yeah. X for you? Some of our good accomplishments have been, uh, we start, we're working with uh, the Swan River First Nation. Actually, it's completed now. We just did a project with them, uh, getting a new sewage lagoon. And we partnered with them because we supply them with water. And the lagoon is on, on uh, First Nation's property. So it needed a new liner and whatnot in it. So they were able to get quite a bit of funding through the federal side of it. So we partnered up and paid for the other the other portion of it. And yeah, everybody's happy with how the how we, everything's been drawn up. We got a long term agreement drawn up with them for 
I think, believe it was 30 years to supply water. And we continued to put the sewer into their lagoon. And, and because Canusa was so small, everybody's, it's hard to, for them to do their own infrastructure. It's hard for us to do our own infrastructure. So we might as well share this stuff and work together on it, right? Uh, we just we'll did just, a, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, just on that note alone, before you continue, what is the relationship like with Big Lakes County and the First Nations in your uh, in, with it, that are in, that Big Lakes County encompasses? And that means Swan River, that means Drift Pile, that means Sucker Creek, that means Gift Lake, if I'm not mistaken. I'm Gift Lake's the settlement. But Gift, Capuino, Gift Lake, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Do you guys work well together? And I say that and uh, knowing the answer, but I just want to make yeah. sure that's on the record. Yeah, no, it's uh it's getting way better. Uh we actually have are having a, a meeting here, I believe it's sometime in November with Driftbile First Nation to see if there's anything that we can work together with, whether it be something along tourism or if there's anything else that we can help help them with. They eh? um but yeah, we like I said, we just finished up with uh with Swan River and that's been going very well working with them. Uh, still working with on with Sucker Creek and uh, Cap Wino, trying to get things sorted out with them and get the ship the ship right a little bit better than what it was because I know there was some some hard feelings from the past and what that's all about we're not sure but we're trying to work forwards with them. It's always about the future, right? Yeah. Respect the past, but look towards the oh, future. Absolutely, can't dwell on the past. Exactly. Um... You talked about water for a second, and I just want to go back to that for a sec for a brief moment and sort of inject interject this question. Water has been kind of a hot topic question for a lot of yeah. municipalities in today's society, infrastructure, but even the drought conditions and lower water levels than we have traditionally seen. Um, in Big Lakes County, I know we're at the end at the beginning of fall here saying this, but looking back on this year. Was it tough for Big Lakes County to try to figure out how to deal with the water issues? Because you do have that beautiful lake, Lester Slave yeah. Lake, that's, that is one of the major bodies of water in this province. But yeah. do you feel like Big Lakes County is set up for the future to potentially see growth if you need it? Because water is such in high demand today. Yeah. At this point, we're in, in pretty good shape. We, got, we don't have to worry about it for a while yet. Uh, the biggest we did come up with a drought management uh initiative there and we put that forward and of course we got the question well why are you doing that we've got the lake right here there's water in the rivers and it's like yeah but we still need to do this because if we don't do it then the province is going to do it and we're going to be then we're going to be maybe misled or not misled isn't the right word but steered down the wrong path for our area so yeah, it was a there was a little bit of challenge here because some of our water does come out of the out of the West Prairie, uh, through from the town of High Prairie, and they had a pump go down or something, so they were a little little concerned that there could be a water shortage, but they got the pump put in and the reservoirs are all full. So, yeah, at this point, there's no no not we're not in any critical situation yet. The best line I ever heard from a comment from an interview I did just recently this year was. There can't be a drought. It rains almost every other day. And I was like, <laughs> what? Seriously? <laughs> okay. Yeah, not every other day, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's my little joke for that little yeah. segment. Of the show. Yeah, well, uh, going back to the original question, though, is about the accomplishments. You yeah. talk about your partnership with Swan uh, River. Is there anything else that you look at and you say, you know what? We're doing this right. Yeah. Uh, I know they finally got us walking trail the way they waited, I don't know how many years for. It's just a short, short version, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, people aren't walking on the, on the streets anymore. They can actually walk on the walking trail and get from one end of the hamlet to the other. Uh, we had and that's for a nilda alone yeah, right that's, that's for the that hamlet <laughs> like i can all imagine other, a walking trail hamlets, through the yeah. entire county would be pretty yeah. hard to <laughs> yeah no all the other hamlets had their walking trails and whatnot everybody they're being well used uh i guess the other thing we can say we had a really good accomplishment we had uh minister sigurdsson and lowen come up and we went on a helicopter tour earlier this summer and uh then later on the summer uh minister schultz came up and we took them over horse lakes and in buffalo bay and that showed them uh the rivers and that they were they're getting plugged up with the logs and having log jams and whatnot and 
blowing the sides out of the out of the out of the berms and whatnot. And we've had sounds like we've had some very good luck. They understand our issues. Uh, they're trying to put together a pilot project so that we as a county can hire contractors locally, get the permits in place, hire lo local contractors to go in, get the logs out, and uh, yeah, hopefully put money back into some of the pockets that are right here in the county and that are paying our taxes rather than going to wherever, whoever the provincial side besides hire and uh, giving them millions and millions. And we don't need millions and millions to get these logs up. We just need permits and a small budget. And then a plan going forward is to maybe keep the logs out of the, out of the lake. Maybe we have to do something upstream and, they're working on that for us as well. So that, everything sounds very promising on that. Um, I kind of have to ask the funny question here because you, you said a word and it perked my ears, but during those helicopter rides with the ministers, did you talk about a helipad? <laughs> I believe it was mentioned <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> but uh, there again, not their portfolio. <laughs> but they're but part no, of they're, cabinet they're and of they are they're, aware of it. Yeah, they are aware of it. Um, I want to turn to a new segment on the show that we're talking about and where it's only for Alberta municipal leaders this year. And that is you have a pending election in 2025 in less than 12, just over 12 months from now, you will be heading to the polls. Uh, will we see Councillor Lane Monteith's name, Deputy Reeves and Lane Monteith's uh, name back on the ballot or have you made that decision yet? Um, without saying yes and no. I'm going to say probably, Chris. I still, the wife and I are still talking about it. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, because, yeah, she's a big part of it. And if she's not happy, then I'm not happy. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I'd love to do it again, I think. Uh, we'll just have to see where it goes. I've got a few other irons in the fire that I'm kind of dealing with as well. So, so I'm going to say I'm probably 75 to 80% sure I'm going to run again. But not always. We're there. still a year away. We certainly are. Um, what advice would you give to a prospective candidate who's thinking about putting their name on the ballot next election? Because I, and I say this, this is Chris Brown, and we talked about it earlier on, but there's an apathy because people just don't think municipal politics is where they want to go. They want to go provincially or even federally because that's where the big money is. And that's where you get to go to Ottawa or you get to go to Edmonton. What advice would you give that prospective new councillor candidate that you wish you would have known? Uh, come in with an open mind. Understand you got to read the material ahead of time and understand that it helps. Uh, yeah, nothing I would, happens. I would hope overnight. it would help. <laughs> yeah, nothing happens overnight. But be prepared when you go into the meeting so that you know what's coming forwards. Because there's nothing worse than going into a meeting and somebody hasn't read the material and what's coming up, and you're going through it. And we just covered that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it happens. There's going to be days when you're not going to ha have the time to do it. But it takes 20 minutes to read through your through your agenda and if something sticks that really impeach your interest read it uh, if you have a chance we usually get our agendas and, and packages uh, three or four days prior to the meeting anyway so you can read it in the evening or whatever but yeah make sure you're prepared for the meetings uh, and realize that nothing happens overnight or it's within a year it's a long process this uh like example is this walking trail we started pushing for that with uh, the rest of council uh, when I first got on and it's just getting done now in year three because you got to make sure you have the budget for it and the money set aside because nothing is cheap anymore. Um, be prepared for the phone calls from constituents because it's going to come. Sometimes fast and furious is oh, not just a movie title. Yeah. It's uh, the way of the life municipal I want to turn to my last subject because I'm cautious of time. And as I said, we've done this once already, and I want to just make sure I'm being respectful for your time for doing this a second time. <laughs> no, no I, want to, I want to talk about my favorite subject and that is tourism. Yeah. I think tour, I think uh, municipalities play a big role in tourism. I just don't think they do, uh, promote themselves as much as they should yeah. And the province promotes the big things, but not the micro hidden gems that each municipality holds for right. you. 
for your district or even your county as a whole, of course, or your ward or your county as a whole, what are the hidden gems in your community that you just love and you wish people knew about? I just like going from one end of the county to the other, uh, seeing the different scenery. Like we get up into that Swan Hills area where they have the Golden Triangle, uh, the, the snowmobile and quad trails that go from uh, Swan Hills to White Court to Edson and back to Swan Hills. And especially this time of year with the colors of the trees and whatnot. And the animals that are on the run, don't drive at night. <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be it can be a little hazardous that way. But yeah, it, it's just a nice drive through Swan Hills in that way. Uh, Canusa, they've got a beautiful little museum there full of all kinds of stuff from when it was being settled. Uh, they actually have a elevator there that the old school elevators that they will open up once or twice a year. So people can go through it. Uh, all kinds of campgrounds from one end of the lake to the other, of course, the resorts and both sides. I mean, we've got Hillary's Bay provincial park on the North side, along with Shaw's point. Uh, Foss has oh, three or four resorts in there and whatnot. Bayshore is one of them. Uh, they all just outside Foss. There's a, uh, place they call the farm and it's you can go in there and you can buy farm fresh uh produce uh the ladies does coffees cookies the whole work she's got a little store set up there it's great uh juice are there again we've got the largest inland marina in alberta i believe they've got 120 slips or something there for boats and 175 uh powered lots for campers and that type of thing uh, several other uh, campgrounds, uh, what the White Sands is one. But yeah, all along that lake, there's some beautiful places to camp. Uh, what else? Uh, I can't Drew, believe. Uh, I, I, I yeah. literally talked to you about this last time. I remember this conversation because... Yeah. <laughs> But Anilda has the best bowling alley in I know, Alberta. Right? Like, how yes, have I... you not mentioned that? You've literally... I haven't made it to Anilda yet. <laughs> I've still got Gerard to go through, which is, it's a great little town, Gerard. It's beautiful scenery, overlooks the Buffalo Bay. In the spring, you get the blue herons coming in, uh, ducks and geese, and all, all the wildlife, or wild, waterfowl comes through there, along with other uh, birds and whatnot. So, yeah, it's just nice to sit up there. And like you say, you go into Anilda, now we've got the walking trail that people can use, the the uh, bowling alley, they've got themselves a little hall, they got a church that was moved there back in the 30s from actually from Gruard in the winter. And that's been designated kind of a historical site or historic point. Uh, yeah, they Anilda just has had, a good farmer's market too, right? Oh, absolutely. Do yeah, I remember every, that correctly? Yeah, first Saturday of every month, I think it runs from 10 till 2 or something. And there's vendors from all over, not just not just in the oldest, High Prairie, Foss, Canuso, all over the county. Canuso has a great little one too. And I believe theirs is the third Saturday of, of every month. I think so. Anilda Farmers Market is the very first farmer market I went to in Alberta. Yeah. And this, and this, this is how Albertan Anilda is. It is the first place I ever tried Tabor corn. Don't know why oh, that really? <laughs> Because the Tabor corn people were there, and I yeah. got to try Tabor corn. So yeah. there's my yeah. little claim to fame. Uh, the Nilda Fire Department looks after the kitchen there, and they have coffee and burgers, and everybody's there. They got everything from uh, knitting to wood products, the guys have made, honey, you name it, it's there. Um. Where do you go? I, I know you're a busy man, but is there a place in the community that you can go and just decompress after a long day? Long get away day from work? everything? I was going to say get away from everything, but if you want to say that, go ahead. I just go out to my cows. <laughs> yeah, we got a few head of cattle here, and that's that's where I go to just kind of decompress. And it's just go out, take the side by side or go out or whatever, and just go out there. They'll come. They're quiet. They come up to you, see what you want. And, yeah, it gives you a new perspective. I got a little bit of a trail through the trees back here. I can go and walk on if it's been a really bad day, but not often. There you go. So my final question for you, Lane, and it's the million dollar one in my opinion, because I think every municipal leader knows how to answer it. Well, let's put it on the record here. In your opinion, what makes Big Lakes County such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Uh, I don't know if it's unique, but the people, 
the people are what keep me here. I mean, yeah, I've got property now. I can get rid of property in a heartbeat. But if it weren't for the people and family or families, I probably I'd be gone too. But no, the people are great. Uh, the small town atmosphere. When you go to town, after you've been here a while, all of a sudden, you know everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's just a friendly little town. All the hamlets are. You know everyone and everyone knows you. And sometimes that's a good thing. And sometimes that could be a yeah. bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've got no complaints. Like I say, my family's been here basically over 100 years, and I wouldn't be anyplace else. I just couldn't. Paint a great picture. Uh, Deputy Reeve, I want to take a moment and say thank you. Um, not only for doing this, but doing this twice. And uh, <laughs> I, I hate to feed a dead horse, but I feel horrible that that, that no, happened. But It's not an issue. I feel like we're now we're better friends than the first time we chatted. So this <laughs> felt like just an old friend conversation again. Yeah. But Lane, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing oh, this interview. No worries. Uh, uh, anytime will, we can get a chance to promote the county and, and the Hamlets in town, it's not a bad thing. And I don't mind doing it two or three times, whatever it takes. Uh, hopefully it won't be a third time, but yeah. maybe we'll be a third time over a cup of coffee though. For sure. For sure. Sounds really good, Chris. Before we wrap up, I just want to take a moment and give an editorial note here. Um, we, we we truly want to thank uh, Deputy Reeve Monteith for sitting down with us, not once, but twice. Unfortunately, our first recording, which was recorded in later September, uh, there was some technical issues and we did not get the quality of audio and the video kind of crapped out on us when we were rendering. So we reached out to the Deputy Reeve uh, afterwards, and he graciously accepted a second chance interview for this. So we do honestly appreciate his time, not once, but twice for sitting down with us and talking about himself and also talking about Big Lakes County. It is truly a pleasure to get to know people who are so sincere and so happy to indulge not just one interview, but two. So thank you so much, Lane, for that great second interview, but also the first interview, which will always is being ingrained in my heart. Uh, we also want to thank you, the viewers and listeners, for tuning in for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Lane and the Deputy Reeve of Big Lakes County, who is truly trying to make a difference in their own community. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us continue to grow and bring you more important conversations like you heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on cross-border interviews. Until then.